The Franciscan Who Led a Crusade St. John Capistron Against the Turks In the early months of 1455, newly elected Pope Calixtus III receives a letter from a longtime friend and confidant. The letter addresses him, quote, I lay my pen aside, and in the veneration of your holiness, in the presence of three brothers, I kiss the ground. After this initial praise, the letter goes on to call the Pope to the immediate attention that threatened all of Christendom. For only two years earlier, in May 1453, all of the Christian world was in shock when the ancient walls of Constantinople were for the first time in its history breached after a 53-day siege by the greatest military leader of his day, Sultan Mehmed II. The 1,000-year-old Christian city was fallen to the Muslim conquerors. And with the blades of his janissary still red with the blood of Greek Christians, the Sultan turned his eyes to the West. The crescent shadow of the Ottoman Empire had loomed over and was slowly engulfing Eastern Europe, with its eyes ultimately on the long-standing prize of all Islamic conquerors, the city of Rome. Sultan Mehmed the Conqueror knew his men, flushed with victory, could in his lifetime see the crosses of St. Peter's Basilica torn down and the minaret raised. The letter, while praising the work of the papacy and patronizing the construction of buildings for the glory of Christ, pleaded with the Pope to set the money aside for the time and dedicated to raising an army to come to the relief of the Eastern Christians who were on the verge of falling. The Pope, trusting the sanctity and integrity of this letter's author, on May the 15th, 1455, issues a bull to all Christian countries to raise crusading armies to come to the relief of their Eastern brethren. The author of the letter was an observant Franciscan, John of Capistrano. Capistron was known internationally as a man of singular determinedness, a brilliant, fiery preacher who at times was ruthless in his speech against heretics and schismatics. Yet in this moment, he laid down all his reservations about the orthodoxy of Christians from the East and called upon Catholic Europe to pick up their swords and crosses and come to the relief of their Eastern brethren. By 1455, Western Christianity was splintering, though. Gone were the days a pope could muster the knights of Europe to go and fight for a holy cause. North, west, and south, nothing but silence and scorn came in response to the pope's call. Capistron, who for years had been working as a tireless administrator for the Franciscan observant reforms, was now, with bull in hand, dedicating himself to the cause of holy war. He used his masterful skills as an orator to whip up popular support among the various cities he had traveled, amassing a small but dedicated group of peasants. A diet was called in Italy. A contingent of Hungarians were present, as well as the Prince of Serbia, George Brankovitz. While the talks began slow, news arrived to the diet that on June 1st, the Sultan's army had taken Nova Brodo, a chief and rich mining town in southern Serbia. Fired up, Prince Brankovitz pledged 7,000 men. King Ladislaus promised 20,000. The kings of Naples and other prin Italian princes committed to only 10,000. Present at this diet is yet another key player in this story, John Hunyadi of Hungary. Hunyadi, not a man who could be said to lack vision, declared that he would defend not only the Christian borders, but that he would carry the war into Asia, taking back Constantinople and then beyond to the Middle East to reclaim the Holy Land. The question remained, though, how would the rest of Europe respond? Poland, Germany, England, France, all remained silent. To give you an idea of the situation on the continent, the House of Habsburg were more concerned about infighting than to worry about the Christians under the knife of the Turks. Many, it is believed, had made overtures to the Turks in anticipation of their imminent victories. Hanyadi had no such qualms. At news of the coming Turkish army, he resigned all of his offices except that of general, and he traded all of his royal apparel to take on the metal armor 
of a Christian knight. Meanwhile, the elderly Capistron was on the move, traveling from city to city, continuing to preach with the fervor of a man in his prime. It is said by his fellow brothers that he was preaching himself into exhaustion. One night, in a dream vision, he heard the Lord tell him that, quote, the higher must serve the lower, and that the time was drawing near. In the coming days, with the small peasant army, most of whom had never seen battle, and were armed with only slings, scythes, and the words of a preacher that they were on their way to protect Christ's children, Capistron, with these men, crossed into Transylvania. Despite the promises of the Italian Diet, after its proceedings, most that attended went back home only to continue squabbling with each other over petty factional and national politics. Hunyadi himself, at his own expense, raised and paid for a Hungarian army of 40,000 men, but even in his homeland, many barons feared him more than the Turks, and made plans to acquiesce the territorial demands of the Sultan as soon as he crossed the border. To make matters worse, combined with his own countrymen's unwillingness to fight, Hunyadi, once seeing the ragtag army of 27,000 men Capistron had brought with him, began to despair that all was lost. From his base, just north of Belgrade, he sent out desperate letters in all directions in one last-ditch effort to have reinforcements sent. Back in Rome, the Pope sent out word for all to pray, fast, and do penance, yet the mood was ominous. A pestilence had broken out in the city. A comet was seen overhead one night, and while many were fleeing the city, the Pope stayed and prayed fervently for Christendom. He called for bells to be rung at noon and vespers, followed by the recitation of three Our Fathers and three Hail Marys. This tradition is carried on to this day with the ringing of the noonday bell. Meanwhile, as Hunyadi waited for word of backup, the Turkish army had arrived. In a letter to the Bishop of Assisi, Capistron writes, quote, The Turkish fleet has already occupied the Danube and controls below Belgrade all passes into Hungary. Today we expect the siege to begin. Never before has the Turk put such large force into action. Christendom is in extreme danger. Hunyadi fights daily against the Turks, but what can he do without assistance? Let the bishops inform the legate, and let the legate do his utmost to move kings and princes to come as quickly as possible. The time for sleep and laziness is gone. It is time to get up. The unbelievable has happened. If kings, princes, barons, and prelates do not wish to be visited by the Turks in their own bedchambers, let them come here. If they wish to keep their possessions, let them send their soldiers to fight at this place of resistance. Here is the place to fight before the Turks become masters on land, as they already are on water. In the days of Mehmed II, there was no greater army on earth than that of the Ottoman Empire. Their size and reputation for violence alone would cause cities to cower and surrender at their approach. The strategy for Belgrade was quite simple. They would blockade the three sides of the river's fork, while on land their forces would set up camp while their massive cannonades that had destroyed the walls of Constantinople were set up. Then, in a series of overwhelming bombings and raids, they would press into the city until it surrendered or was obliterated. The city of Belgrade, full still of its inhabitants who hadn't left, including women and children, watched in horror as the endless supply of wagons brought a sea of men, weapons including artillery that was manned by Christians, flags, animals including dogs who were said to feast on the flesh of men. As well, word quickly spread through the city that the Sultan had brought his most able general, Karadaja Pasha. The Turks from land and sea would bombard the defending cities with sounds of brass and drums night and day and a very effective and terrifying psychological warfare strategy. Despite all of this, laying siege to a city was a risky move as it could delay an army for months, affecting morale and mobility, crucial for an army that was used to victory after victory. Pasha, a brilliant military man himself, advised the Sultan to hold off from laying siege. Yet the Sultan, certain of his men, declared that within a fortnight 
he would be celebrating Ramadan in Budapest, hundreds of miles north. American revolutionary Thomas Paine once wrote that being the underdog in battle made for times that tried men's souls. In this case, it was certainly no different. Hunyadi, feeling pressures from all sides, began to waver and made plans for surrender, surrendering terms to the Sultan. Yet in his ranks, there was no ordinary soldier. Though Capistron had demanded that all priests were forbidden to take up weapons in the battle, that their job was to administer sacraments pray and carry banners and crosses, he was still nonetheless ready to die in defense of the people of a city he only first set in foot in a few days prior. Anyadi, camped with his men several miles north of the city, was ready to call it quits, when in the cover of night Capistron slipped into his camp and roused the general to fight, declaring victory was neither his nor Hunyadi's, but God's. Hunyadi, Roused by the sight of this frail, aged Franciscan, found his resolve and set his men ready to fight to the death. On July 14th, Capistron declared a general absolution to the entire army, and with that, the battle for Belgrade commenced. With the war cry on their lips of Jesus, Hanyadi's men, on the moonless night, made their way down the Salem River, crashing directly into the Turkish ships, catching them entirely off guard. Confusion set in in the Turkish ranks. The sailors from inside Belgrade took the initiative at this and set their ships after the fleeing Turkish ships. To everyone's amazement, on a high hill to the north, visible to friend and within shot of the enemy, stood the small Franciscan, waving a long banner of the cross. Those around him heard him invoking his favorite devotion, the most holy name of Jesus. The double attack from Hamyadi and the sailors in the city completely routed the Turkish ships. Within a few hours, five of their galleys had sunk, and they had lost 2,500 men. The Christian ships, now with numerical advantage, surrounded the port side of Belgrade, and on July 16th, Hamyadi and Capistrano entered the city. The soldiers, bold with victory, rushed out of the city on the opposite side to meet the Turkish army on land. By this point, they had become used to seeing the image of this elderly monk walking in their ranks, defying death, urging them on, praying over them. The sight of Capistran alone brought feelings of admiration among the soldiers. While never having carried a weapon other than the cross, he was during this entire period covered in the filth and blood of battle. As daily the crusaders were pushing back against the Turks, word of the naval success trickled northward bringing back with it men to reinforce the battle. On the final day, the Franciscan friars, alongside Greek Orthodox clerics, led mass in open view of the enemy, after which they began to sing their offices. The fighting force had proven that dedication and conviction could overcome disparity in numerous and armament. Against all odds, this mixed group of soldiers, farmers, monks, clerics, short on weapons but overflowing with zeal, was taking on and beating back the most powerful military the world had known to that point. Capistran himself told a Turkish messenger to return to his camp and quote, tell your grand dog that if he does not cease this heinous plan, the hand of the Lord is about to strike him down. Food in the Turkish camps was getting scarce, and more disturbing, a courier came to the Sultan with the message that his lands in the east were th being threatened by the Persians. The Sultan had the messenger beheaded and dared anyone else to bring him bad news. On the morning of July 21st, his great advisor Pasha was struck and killed. In a last ditch attempt, the Sultan gave everything he had with the music and prayers of the Turks roaring across the land. He plunged head first into the Crusader army who had in their turn chanted the holy name of Jesus. The fighting was gruesome, hand to hand combat. With the bulk of his army pressed against the drawbridge, the Sultan watched in horror as the Crusaders set the bridge on fire, killing scores of Turkish fighters. And with that, the Sultan retreated, and the battle was over. Standing there among the dead and dying, among the victors in Hunyadi, stood the brave preacher, who had been seen throughout the entire battle, carrying the banner of the cross. 
Sultan Mehmed the Conqueror himself never returned to Belgrade, instead focusing his efforts elsewhere, including attempts to attack southern Italy from the sea. And it wasn't until many decades later that the Ottomans, under Mehmed's great-grandson, Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent, took Belgrade in 1521. In the meantime, after the siege, the great Franciscan John of Capistrano died from the plague which the Turkish army had brought with it to Serbia. Many depictions of John, the little Franciscan who led a crusade, show him as a young, healthy man. While this sentiment is understandable, it actually does damage to the legacy. As an actuality, St. John was in his mid-70s at the time of the battle. He was frail and tired from his years of work in Central Europe before coming east to lead the crusade. And though militarily Hunyadi does deserve his share of credit, all historians agree that the ultimate success of the battle hinged upon the example of the little Italian friar, who with the most holy name of Jesus on his lips, was able to win the devotion of men who were ready to follow him to their deaths or their victory.